Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Open House at Home 2021, the virtual version of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory's trademark fall event. Of course, we all wish we could have done this in person, but uh, sadly, in another pandemic accommodation has had to happen. Um, we're here tonight to talk about one of the most promising and important solutions to the worldwide crisis of climate change, a crisis caused by the relentless dumping of the byproducts of fossil fuel combustion, in particular carbon dioxide, into our atmosphere, a pollutant. The resulting warming of the world's climate has disrupted our weather systems in ways that have caused the world to take notice. The heat dome over the Pacific Northwest, the consecutive record-breaking wildfire seasons in the West, the flooding emergencies in Europe during the summer, and then here on the East Coast in early September. Climate change now demands our attention. Homes, lives, and livelihoods are being lost daily around the world. Now, as world leaders consider interventions, the call to drastically reduce greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is louder than ever. We need to change the way we produce and use energy. We need to change the way we heat and cool our homes, the way we drive to and from work in the grocery store, the way we travel the globe, it's all on the table. Some of these changes might not really be noticeable once they're in place in our, in our daily lives. Others may require us to modify our behaviors in different ways. This evening, we will explore one extremely promising renewable energy source, and that is wind energy. My colleague and Lamont's Deputy Director, Dave Goldberg, will moderate a discussion with panelists, Professor Robin Bell, and Professor Roisin Kamein, both colleagues of mine here at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Dave is a leading innovator in the field of carbon mineralization beneath the ocean. What does this mean? It is an area of science that focuses on the capture and storage of carbon dioxide beneath the seafloor. His work on climate solutions is groundbreaking and more necessary than ever. Professor Robin Bell is a polar research pioneer, a geophysicist who has served as the lead scientist on numerous expeditions in Greenland and Antarctica, and also expeditions closer to home. More recently, she and Dave have been working together on a proposal to harness the ambitious mid-Atlantic-based wind energy projects to delve more deeply into how ocean data um, responds to the establishment of wind farms and, and how those marine wind farms could impact our environment. Professor Roisin Kamein is an atmospheric scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and also in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. As the leader of the Kamein Atmospheric Composition Group at Columbia University, she leads cutting edge work tracking the ongoing changes to our atmosphere, including pollution, most especially pollution. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to what promises to be a fascinating and informative discussion. And at this point, I will hand the virtual mic over to Dave Goldberg. Dave? Here I am. Thanks, Mo. Thank you. Uh everyone for joining this evening um, for what I hope is an exciting and interesting panel discussion uh, with Robin and Roisin. Thanks you both, hi to you both. Um, let me just say a few words setting the stage uh, briefly for our discussion. And that is in regard to uh, our, our particular region in the mid-Atlantic here. Um, we are embarking on the development of perhaps the world's largest offshore wind farm in one of the most populated regions in the world, and especially in the United States. Uh, some 30% of our population is along this coastline, and about 28% um, or, or more of the country's GDP as well. It's an incredibly uh, extraordinary time of, of change and action. Um, with new oceanside development and growth potential, um, and sometimes referred to uh, as the blue economy. 
So this um, project, that this, this development, will position offshore wind uh, to become a major source of affordable, renewable power uh, for New York uh, and the tri-state area. The state itself is on well on its way developing something on the order of 9 billion watts of offshore wind energy by 2035. That's enough to power 6 million homes uh, uh, at, at current efficiencies anyway. And um, we are looking for uh, to understand what this means for our, both our shorelines, uh, our environment, and of course the climate. So to begin the discussion, I'd like to first invite Robin and Roisin to share a little bit about the research they do and um, how they particularly got to do that at Lamont Doherty. So maybe let's uh, start with Robin. Robin Bell, give us uh, a few words about your background. Hi, thank you very much, Dave. And thanks, Mo, for introducing us. Um, I'm, I've been at Lamont for most of my career. Actually, Dave was a, um, TA in one of the first classes I took at Lamont. <laughs> so Dave and I go back a long way in terms of our using physics and geology to understand how the planet works. And my joy has always been figuring out new ways to measure things and look at things. And much of that has ended up taking me to places where there's, I like to think of intellectual and discovery space. So that's driven me to the poles where there's little did I know when I started 30 years ago that there was going to be such change and such discovery. Great, thanks Robin. Uh, now, Roisin, you lead a atmospheric research, science research group, Columbia. Um, how did you get to be that, doing that and here, especially at Lamont in Columbia? Um, so my background's in chemistry. Um, I'm an atmospheric chemist. Um, I like looking at how the air we see in the atmosphere, what is driving that? So a lot of the work I did before Lamont was measuring CO2 and methane in the atmosphere from planes, towers, take your pick, and then trying to figure out what was driving what we were seeing in the atmosphere. Um, I did a lot of work in the Arctic, um, a lot of aircraft work flying around the world, looking at CO2 and methane. Um, and what I was really shocked by with that global aircraft campaign was just how high the concentrations were in the Arctic when that air did not come from the Arctic. Um, so when I moved to New York in 2018, I kind of did a bit of digging around and cities are about 70% of global CO2 emissions. I was in the biggest one in the US that happened to have the biggest CO2 footprint in the US. Um, so since I got here, I've been trying to develop a measurement network, um, trying to understand, can we measure the changes in CO2 in the atmosphere from a city the size of New York? Um, and a lot of the, the work has been trying to figure out how to get different state agencies to talk to one another. Um, New York is not just New York State, New Jersey is right there. Um, and trying to figure out how the CO2 and the methane are really connected with all the pollution emissions we see. So all the sources of CO2 in a city are sources of NOx or ozone or other pollutants that really harm health. Um, so what I've been trying to figure out is what exactly is going on in New York because none of the numbers make any sense when we take them all together in the atmosphere. So that's kind of how I got into things around New York City. Great, thanks. Thank you. It, it, it feeds directly into my first question, which um, I'll, I'll pose to you, uh, Roisin, and that's looking at wind energy and the potential as an alternative energy source. Um, we need to understand what's, what's at stake, why it's important, and why we need that kind of renewable energy to pivot away from fossil fossil fuel energy. Um, so, and you, you alluded to this, but can you set the stage a bit on, and the health of the atmosphere right now, um, as you see, as you've measured it, as you observe it, compared to um, uh, pre-industrial revolution, say, uh, historically at least. 
Yeah, so for things like CO2 and methane, I mean, the methane went from about 700 ppb to over 2000 now in places. Um, so we're looking at almost a doubling in the methane. Now, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's about 85 times that of CO2 over 20 years, but it only has an atmospheric lifetime of about 10 years. Um, so if we really want to make a change in the impact of these gases in the atmosphere, methane is a pretty good one to target. Um, but the CO2 has gone from ridiculously low levels like 260 that you really don't hear about to we're looking at 415, 420. I often see 500 ppm in New York City. So the concentrations have really rocketed up some from the late 1850s, 1900s. Um, much of the warming that went with that is, is a little delayed because of other pollutants that we see in the atmosphere. Um, so for things like if we're thinking about it in a global context, while the CO2 and the methane are causing an awful lot of warming, the pollutants that are co-emitted with those when they are emitted, there's something like 9 million people per year had the premature deaths per year based on air pollution. And all of those are also sources of CO2. So there's, it's not just the warming, the health impacts that go with that from the co-emitted species are also really important. And I think that often gets lost in the the climate discussion, they are all really important. Um, and they have all completely changed from since pre-industrial and it's all the same types of sources that we need to keep in mind. So it's not just carbon dioxide alone. Not just carbon dioxide at and, all. And um, can, can you say anything more specific to the trike state region uh, evolution? Yeah, um, I was quite shocked when I moved to New York. As you can tell, I'm not from New York, I'm not American. Um, in Europe and in Ireland, you do not have power plants in the middle of an urban area because the health impacts of burning that much of anything are going to cause things like the London fog that caused the, you know, 12,000 people died in London in the 1950s that spurred their Clean Air Act. They moved all the power plants out of the city as soon as they could. They were all gone by the 80s. New York City has a huge number of power plants, most of them along the East River. And you look at all these emissions and when they're designed to kind of, if it's a big enough power plant, they have massive stacks. You see them along the East River, they're 400 feet high and they emit things and then send it to Connecticut. That's fine. The problem is when the weather conditions <laughs> condense and it, it drags everything down to the surface so that we've got really bad pollution in the poorer areas in the city. And a lot of that is we're relying on both the power plants, but also New York City I have never lived anywhere with as much oil, natural gas and propane burned in the winter time to heat the houses. I'm used to like, even in Boston, it wasn't that bad when I was there for years. So it's really been eye opening to see just all the combustion sources that we see in the atmosphere in the middle of the city. I really thought that we would have gone moved beyond that. We are 30, 50 years behind European cities when it comes to allowing combustion within cities and allowing that pollution to build up. In 2015, um, they're finally, they ruled out people burning bunker fuel in the city. Now this is the stuff that hasn't, is not even allowed to be burned on ships at sea anymore because it's so polluting and it gives off so much sulfur. So the sulfur levels in New York City, that's why the buildings were falling apart. The pollution levels were horrific. They only got around to changing that law in 2015, like, that is way behind anywhere else I have ever lived. Like, it's just stuff has been forgotten. There's been no investment, no development. We should be getting rid of combustion within cities completely if we really want to care about people's health. And all of that could help us wean off the CO2 while we're at it. So they really are completely interconnected for that. And it's energy. We need the energy. Well, we do, we do need energy, yes. <laughs> yes, we'll get there. Uh, Robin, so along, along the same uh, approach, First, first, the big picture, um, what kind of climate impacts have you observed in your pioneering work in polar regions? Um, and then what are you most concerned about? So I say locally, meaning tri-state, New York, whatever you consider local these days. Whatever is local. Well, first, you know, my, and this is gonna be whiplash from, <laughs> from machines talking about the air quality in the, along the East River to, uh, my work in the polar regions, which used when I started in the 1990s was considered very quaint and sort of, it's nice you're doing that, honey. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you're doing it, it doesn't really matter. 
And even the first papers I wrote when we talked about the ice sheets changing, we found a volcano underneath the ice sheet and we wanted to speculate how, what role that might play. And we had to remove the language from the paper that it might change fast, just because the community did not believe that these massive pieces of ice could actually change in anybody's lifetime. So now we have very solid records from uh, instruments that measure how they're fast the ice is going to instruments that measure the surface of the ice, to instruments that measure how much the ice weighs. In the same place, we can see the ice getting lower, speeding up and losing mass. And what you end up seeing when you go there, you see basically scars along the landscape where it's like bathtub rings, only it's not that the water's fallen, it's that the ice has dropped. They're very spectacular and noticeable in Greenland. So it's one of these, it, one of these earth systems that we as humans didn't think could change as fast as it's actually changing. That these continental scale pieces of ice we consider could only, naturally change on the sort of 10,000 year scale. We didn't expect to see them changing on the decade to century. So that's why I can still remember the mo first moment where I can remember exactly where I was standing when a friend called to tell me that Greenland was changing faster than he ever could have imagined. We were talking about something else. And I can still remember I was standing there watching, this is be picking up my luggage and the luggage went around and around and around. And I could actually hear the fear in this scientist's voice that the systems were changing faster than we can imagine. So that's the kind of observations that I've seen and my community has seen. And it's completely different from where Roisin sees, but it's again, it's the impact of humans that are making this change happen faster than we could have imagined. Right. Right. So um, I know, I know, Roisin, you've also looked at um, other areas beyond the city, shall we say, uh, more toward the north. Um, and, and in that context, both of you, uh, with massive development of new offshore wind as a renewable energy source, the Biden administration is looking at something far beyond what we were just what I mentioned earlier about the East Coast, Mid Atlantic area, and much faster. Um, 30 billion watts of energy that's in million, 20 plus millions of homes uh, could be powered by that in a very short time frame. Um, and now that's a, that's a very ambitious and um, a goal. Uh, but what would be the, what would happen if we don't do that? And particularly on that area. That um, that I was referring to for you, Roisin, north of north of New York, a few thousand kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually do a lot of work in Alaska, um, yeah, looking yeah. at Arctic permafrost, and we've been studying how much CO two and methane is coming out, and the the soils up there are really they're really peaty. So about as much CO two is currently in the atmosphere, twice as much of that carbon is locked up in those soils. And we don't expect all of that to end up in the atmosphere. We don't expect it to be a very fast response. But what we have been really shocked at is how slow the soils are to freeze in the winter now. It used to take them two weeks and the soils would freeze in August or September and they'd freeze right through and you'd end up with layers freezing down and everything would be frozen solid. And entire communities are built on this permafrost. They are relying on the solid areas to be able to construct buildings, for example. And what we're finding now is that the, the global warming isn't uniform. The Arctic is warming at twice the rate as everywhere else, but it's also warming a lot more in the winter than the summer. It is warming in the summer too, but it's the winters aren't getting cold. So what we're finding is that the, the soils are retaining an awful lot of that heat. So the microbes that live in the soils are staying active for three and four months now into the winter instead of freezing solid in the two weeks normally. So we're seeing a lot more CO2 and methane coming out during that period. Um, and that's that's happening already. We, we don't even have controls to do soil warming experiments anymore. 
And that's been really shocking to me is we had all these soil warming experiments set up by various PIs and looking at all of this stuff and the soils are warming so fast, you can't really have a control anymore. And that now to me was, okay, there's something seriously wrong there. Um, and we do see massive amounts of CO2 and methane, but the enhancements we're seeing in the Arctic, while they are big, most of the CO2 and methane that we see in the Arctic is driven by emissions in the mid latitudes being pushed north by the winds. So we, we, we see the culmination of all of these, the, the emissions we have down here, all the pollutants, anything that is long lived enough to make it up there, we see that eventually in the Arctic because the way the winds push everything to the north. So that was, I mean, that's pretty much how I got into the urban stuff down here. It was just so shocking to see the changes up there. Nobody in Alaska argues about climate change. Doesn't matter what your flavor of politics is, it's happening. They're learning to adapt to it and they're trying to figure out how they're going to save villages that are now currently falling into the sea because the permafrost isn't stable anymore. So it's a very different conversation when you're in Alaska chatting with people about what they are seeing, what they are living through. Um, and we're kind of buffered from it down here, but we're the cause of it, which is kind of, we can do something about it down here. They're just seeing the repercussions of what we're doing. It just strikes me all of a sudden realizing that you both are studying polar regions and have walked back to the source of the problem right outside your door uh, here <laughs> some, to some extent. But yeah, um, we can do something down here. Yeah, we can, we maybe can make some change. So. Let's go back to the New York, the more New York uh, mid Atlantic centric uh, view. And um, I'll ask Robin, um, what, what your perspective on this plan for expansive offshore wind energy um, along the Atlantic coastline will look like? Um, what will it, what will it, what will, what will it do for us in the sense of energy, which you know, other than the energy itself, um, but are there, in particular, are there specific challenges in implementing it? It's such an interesting question because you can think of wind farms as being simply beautiful. I mean, nobody would argue that those power plants along the East River are beautiful. I mean, just look at Rasheen's face. I mean, nobody. <laughs> Nobody thinks of those as beautiful. And, and I just interject there. Um, London has turned all of their power plants into museums. The Tate Modern okay. and Battersea power plants are becoming art okay. installations. They're if quirky. they're art installations, but if they're making energy, less so, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's this concept we have that we've been living, we've been benefiting from energy whose source we haven't been really seeing, you know, whether it's coal, you know, mountaintop removal for coal that used to be what was up and down the Hudson River, or whether it's oil, which we, you know, we're lucky, we don't, our, our beaches tend not to be impacted by it. So the concept that we could be part of our shift to powering my computer, the lights in my room, my um, the, the electric cooling unit and heating unit we have in the house to get a, that we have to get away from fossil fuels, that if that could all be powered by wind, it would be such a big shift for us in terms of the consequences of what's happening to the ice sheets, what's happening to the temperature, What's happening to the sea level? The things that you know, Rasheen talk worries about um, the chemistry. I worry about the temperature and the sea level, and you know the fact that my daffodils come up sooner, my basil and tomatoes last longer. It's that temperature is going to impact us all. Um, so, what is the wind going to do? It is a way where we can be intentional about developing this offshore region into a resource that allows us to live sustainably on this planet. So to me, that's what's so powerful about it. And, you know, I'm a sailor, so I know it's gonna change what it looks like. I know that, you know, there are people who consider um, that, you know, the Navy doesn't like them. They're, they're, they're gonna not be as good for radar, yeah, because they're gonna be radar targets. Um, but 
I, overall, it is really where we have to go is that we have to, ex we have to accept that may, there may be some minuses, but overall, I think we have to consider this as a way that we intentionally can move forward or with how we power our lives. And that we have to look at it as a positive move because it's certainly better than the impacts that Roisin has been describing. So I don't wanna pick on you, Robin, but you know, that's so, it's such an inspiring view. Um, but as you know, any kind of development anywhere, mm -hmm. anyhow, is yep. um, often fraught with tensions and conflicts from, yep. different, from different perspectives, from different mm -hmm. users, um, from different stakeholders. So for example, uh, you, you mentioned the Navy might not be very receptive for very different reasons than say mm -hmm. the consumer may be not receptive in that they worry about its um, uh, the effectiveness of that energy supply, for example. And, and other energy suppliers may, be, may see it as a, as a competition and be resistant to accepting it. So there's, there's complex issues here, of course. Mm -hmm. But as scientists uh, with the climate change perspective and knowing the stakes involved, um, uh, both of you actually, uh, what, what can we think to do to help alleviate those conflicts and concerns and tensions from our perspective, if you will? You mean as a scientist or as a human yeah. being? Yeah, I mean, what can we do as scientists to help fix these other uh, uh, conflicts and tensions? Well, I think some of it is attempting to ensure that we're at the table and talking about how they can be a positive tech hub, innovation site. And that it's not in trying to bring our knowledge on how Rasheen and I both love to measure things and think about the earth. And if we do it intentionally, the instrumentation and shared knowledge you could get from an observation system associated with a wind farm could be a marvelous new tool for science. It's also trying to make sure that we can be part of the conversation so it's not, it. we can help diffuse people who think change is hard and possibly having um, windmills or wind turbines on the horizon might be ugly. Um, it's part of this conversation of how do we say that this is part of our future? And we're used to looking at the telephone poles running up and down our road. They aren't really very pretty, are they? I don't think so, but we don't even see them, right? So it's again, trying to be part of the conversation of the change and understanding that change is hard and looking, possibly looking for other roles. You know, I think this is something Dave's very keen on is how can we use the excess energy maybe to use it to sequester carbon? So suddenly you're doing more than just making energy, you're actually trying to address the CO2 that Rasheen was talking about, trying to pull down those numbers so that we can ensure our planet isn't too hot. Thanks, right, I agree. Many, many pieces, many facets to that. Roisin, do you have any, any thoughts on how to engage in, um, in effective ways as the scientific community beyond obviously doing all the things that you do? Um, well, I think things like having the discussion about how reliable are various. So I, Personally, I think we're going to have to do all the things to reduce the combustion. There's going to have to be way more approaches than we possibly, we have to do everything we can think of and more to actually mm -hmm. reduce the temperature, reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but I think a lot of the discussion for, say, wind energy is how, what happens when the wind stops? What happens when the sun stops? Um, and I think having a lot more discussion about battery storage and how we're going to store the energy to make sure it's available when people need it. I mean, there's going to be a lot more discussion, I think, as we start electrifying the car fleet. We're going to have people charging their vehicles overnight. That's going to be a huge increase in the amount of energy needed at a time when solar can't step in. Oftentimes, if it's on, on shore, wind energy still nights are a killer for that. Now, I think the offshore is a very different story because you have at least 
it's, it is a lot more reliable, it's a lot windier at sea. Um, but there will be times when that dies back. So how are we going to have the conversation about energy? Do we encourage everyone who has an electric car to make sure they have adequate battery storage, that they could actually be charging back up again at different times or feeding back into the grid? So I think having, like pushing the conversation about having a, like if everybody has solar on their roof, maybe we need less of an integrated uh, um, I guess a more, I can't even think of the word right now, but feeding energy back into the grid and have it more disaggregated that we're, we're looking at energy in a different way. I think there's been a lot of discussion about, oh, if we just want to turn off that power plant. That's fine, but for New York City, there isn't enough power as it is. Through the summer, all the universities, every big building, they have to turn back on their, their cogen, their, their boilers, if you like, and burn a whole bunch of natural gas in the summertime to provide AC power, power for air conditioning to reduce the temperature, because the city's power grid can't deal with it without that additional emissions. Now, none of those have tall chimneys like the power plants. So all of those emissions end up at street level. And some of that is during the day, some is at night. And I think there needs to be more discussion about, well, where is our energy coming from right now? Are you OK with all of those pollution emissions on your street, coming from your building, landing right in front of you? So I think if there was more discussion, if there was more discussion with everyone about where is your power coming from right now, I think people would be more accepting of where it needs to come from in the future. It's completely, most people flick a switch. They have no idea where the power comes from. I didn't know before I moved to New York and I had, must say I am shocked <laughs> how much of it is just filthy, filthy production of combustion of something that is then giving asthma to kids because there's a power plant right beside a school, you know, and it's stuff that if we think about it and we hear about it, we consider it unacceptable. And yet th that discussion isn't happening. So it means that when somebody's talking about wind, they're talking about aesthetics and not how, how much you could reduce the pollution load and somebody's risk of asthma right next door to you. And I think having those decoupled is not helpful. We need to have the discussion where they both come together. Where is your power coming from right now? Do you know? I don't always know. I'm learning. It's hard to find that information, which is probably one of the problems. But we so, need to have that conversation. Yeah, I fully, I fully on board with that conversation. Um, I'm, I'm noticing a question in the chat that is is relevant here, and you may be able to add a little bit more uh, insight here. And that was the question is regarding examples of offshore wind uh, that exists today. And, and we do know that the Vineyard Wind Project, uh, well, you know, the first utility scale one in the U.S. Um, in Massachusetts uh, is, is, is operating. Um, but it, there's some, there's some um, controversy there, uh, particularly whether it causes some sort of air pollution. Can you add any, any thoughts about that to explain? So I think it, that's a, an interesting question because it depends how you phrase it. Um, if you have wind energy and you don't have suitable power for when the wind stops, then you could possibly have more pollution. The wind, the wind, the wind farm itself is not going to pollute anything from an air pollution perspective. The question is often wrapped up in what happens if you don't have adequate battery storage? There are technological solutions to make sure that wind energy is pollution free. How it's set up right now means that you have to worry about things of if you have a power plant and it's natural gas, when you turn it on, you have twice as much emission for the first hour as you do when it's operating. Now, you still have massive pollution emissions while it's operating. So if you can turn off that power plant for a week or two weeks or however long, you'll reduce the emissions to zero. So really, it depends on how intermittent is the wind. If you have to keep turning on every hour or every two hours to fill an intermittent gap in the amount of energy provided from wind, then yes, the overall integrated process could possibly be a larger pollutant than if it was just the natural gas plant. Mm -hmm. But if you can turn that off for days at a time, then no, it's not. So it kind of depends on the infrastructure around the wind farm rather than the wind farm itself. So this is this actually goes to the question of, of uh, what how, how the how the whole ecosystem of energy collectively is built, the grid, um, mm -hmm. how how intermittent one source or another mm -hmm. storage, and in fact also uh, 
um, uh, ramp up and ramp down. Those yes. are, you know, yeah. uh, minimizing those those things. So it's a it's a complex engineered system that we really the wind is just a part a part of it. But the battery yeah. battery storage is really coming on, and yes. New York is investing a lot in that. And I think if we can push that forward, a lot of these problems just disappear. And I think it's also this. I mean, it's what I learned. We did a net zero renovation of you know, our professional headquarters. And what I le learned was to get to net zero, you can't just do one thing. Wind is not the only solution. We need to do wind and solar. In that case, we needed to do solar, um, green walls to clean the air in the buildings, uh, LED lighting, reuse of the water and a heat exchange with the sewer. And it was only by putting all those systems together that we were able to get to net zero. And I often reflect that that's the same thing we as a society have to do. We have to look at this as a system so we can get to net zero. It's not going to be just, you know, wind farms alone aren't going to do it. And solar alone isn't going to do it. So it's this, again, this how we come up with this integrated system where we can have clean air and the lights on. So, Robin, uh, you're, you're meant, you, you queued up my next question, which is, you know, you and I, especially, and many people here at Lamont are focused on ocean research and understanding the oceans and impacts and all, all mm -hmm. that, uh, observing the oceans. Um, so that's an important part of, of clim climate and clim understanding climate and climate change. But what do you see as the, both uh, on the impact side, we've talked about this a little bit in terms of visual, but other ways to help the development of offshore wind that will both protect the oceans and maybe um, address some of these integrating questions. Uh, right. how, do we, how do we how do we pull things together? Right, and so it's this question of, I mean, there's several layers to that. How do we see wind development as more than just um, energy sources pumping energy back? How do we think about it as that integrated goal? And that's where you start to think about using the excess energy, i.e. those times when the wind's blowing more than New York City needs it. What do you do with that energy? Can you either store it like Rasheen's talking about, or do you use it to sequester and put carbon into the sediments that are out there on the continental shelf? So that's one layer is coming, ensuring that it's um, an integrated view. The other one is, what else can we do and how do we intentionally develop, I'm not sure develops the right word, how do we intentionally bring the continental margin, which is where they're, you know, the shallow part that extends about a hundred miles is, you know, if you drive offshore New York City, it, it's about a, it's about a hundred miles before you get to the deep water. And that's because that's called the continental shelf. It's shallow. Um, how do we embrace using that region in a way that's more than just power and possibly is innovative? How do we think about it as an aquaculture site? How do we think of what other technology and innovation and observations we could be doing there, whether it's improving our models of weather, if we know better what the weather, what the um, temperatures of the water and the, the waves are out there, and then how, this is really my, my dream, is that we turn New York Harbor from being a harbor that primarily supports cruise ships and cargo ships and a little bit of commuting back and forth and ferries. How do we make it into a technology innovation center based on that blue economy? How do we make it so instead of it being this tension between people who are worried about their view the wind turbines, the fishermen, and then maybe some people who are suddenly worried about the whales, because that's a convenient excuse to cover your not wanting to see them. How do we actually turn this into something positive, that this is an opportunity for us to be intentional about how we develop our continental margin? Great. It's a, it's a huge change. Um, yeah. In so many areas. Um, so question, Rosh, Roshin, and this refers to one of the questions I noticed in the chat um, was how, how fast do things get better if we if we were able to snap our fingers and and, um, you know, 
for example, put renewable energy in place of all those nasty fossil plants that are existing right now. We could just do that today and snap our fingers. How fast would things get better? How, how fast would the air get clear, for example? And you are, um, you are actively, uh, have been actively taking advantage of um, an inadvertent uh, mm. experiment um, in, recent, in recent year, year and a half uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and you studied the CO changes in the CO2 and atmospheric load um, pollutants in, in the atmosphere in and around New York, I believe. So you can tell us a little bit more about that and what you what you observed and what you think might how what we could learn from that in terms of improving based on renewable uh, renewable development. Yeah, so we um, we have a measurement site in uh, Harlem um, as part of the City University of New York, um, and we started in January 2020 and have been going ever since. But we just happened to get lucky to be measuring when everything shut down. Um, so it was quite interesting to see um, a lot of the so something like CO2, the atmospheric lifetime in the atmosphere. So how long it lives in the atmosphere is about 100 years. So if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, we would still see all the CO2 in the atmosphere. For other gases, they have a shorter lifetime. Um, so methane lives about 10 years. For things like ozone and NOx, you're talking hours, minutes, days. So we would see changes in the atmosphere actually surprisingly quickly. Now, during COVID, all the cars disappeared pretty much in New York City. All the transportation, we thought, okay, great. If it's about, you know, two thirds of say the CO, for example, the carbon monoxide. So that's the kind of stuff that can actually do damage to you. Your body takes it in and thinks it's oxygen. Um, so you don't want high concentrations of CO. If all of that was from vehicles, great, it should all disappear. We happened to get lucky with the weather at the same time and had all these weather systems flush out the city. So we saw a 40% drop in the CO, a 40% drop in the NOx. We saw about, yeah, it, it kind of varied for CO2 and methane, five to 10% drop in those. And we were really surprised thinking, okay, we should be seeing an awful lot more of that, but it means that we were misattributing we thought the traffic was way more polluting than it actually is. So the, the experiment that we got to conduct as part of COVID was being able to pull apart what the various contributions are from. There is way more pollution from buildings than I ever thought before I got to New York. And without COVID, we would never have known. We've been blaming traffic for everything. It's not always the traffic. Now, I will say what everybody noticed in the city was how clean it was, but it wasn't really how clean it was. It was how quiet it was. So we're very sensitive to noise pollution and all the trucks and cars being gone. Everybody thought Harlem was just so nice to go for a walk. And that's really what people picked up on. The concentration changed, but it didn't completely clean up. Um, but I think it was very interesting to learn from that. I mean, we're seeing now the traffic's worse than it ever was. Um, the pollution we see, um, I tell people what kind of, numbers we see for CO2 and methane and CO in New York City and they laugh at me going that's your clean day that's like the filthiest they've ever heard of um so I mean I've measured in the middle of forest fires that have lower concentrations of these pollutants than New York City on a bad day so when we get these stagnation events where the weather just kind of causes all the winds to to stop if you like so we get all this stagnation you get these really high heat events the pollution levels in New York City are astronomical. They shouldn't be, but they are. And all of that is whatever we emit locally ending up in the atmosphere. It's not stuff coming in. We can't blame, we can blame some of New Jersey, but not all of it on New Jersey. So that's been quite interesting to see from a, yes, we can flush it out if we get lucky with the weather, pushing it all out to sea and let it be processed. So those pollutants can get eaten up in the atmosphere by um, the hydroxyl radical. So it's it's, if you take some air, add some sunlight, add some water, you'll make this stuff that just chews up all the pollution. And it takes different amounts of time to destroy different things. So for CO2, it doesn't do anything to CO2. CO2 will sit there for 100 years. So it's the other stuff we can really make a difference with. For CO2, we're going to have to start taking it out rather than we'll have to stop emitting. And I think a lot of the conversation about net CO2 
personally, I'd like to change that conversation to zero combustion. Because if we're combusting any fuel in a city, we're going to get the co-pollutants that I'm measuring. It's not all from vehicles, which I thought a lot more of it would be. It's from buildings and people's use of buildings. Buildings aren't alive. People's use of their space is what's contributing to the combustion to keep them all powered. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my, my side of it is it depends how long, depends which chemical you're talking about and how long it lives in the atmosphere. But we could do an awful lot with some stuff very quickly. Absolutely, great, great. So I have um, uh, a, a question. A, a question in the in the chat was uh, regarding the reliability, effectively, of, of wind resources, and we touched on that a little bit in, in context of integrating systems, which I personally believe is absolutely critical. Uh, multiple systems, storage of energy, different different renewables together, will solve our needs. But um, um, this year, uh, we had, we, or in this year in the U.S., we had record-breaking coals in Texas, um, and that was that was uh, in some part blamed on the, the wind energy uh, infrastructure there. Um, a complex relationship between both the uh, policy and grid and technology, so it's not a simple answer there. But it does question the reliability of, of wind energy, um, even as a component of a wind system or sorry, a reliable, a renewable energy system. So can you say something about and, and or reiterate um, what you see as the most important pieces of, of the wind system in particular, adding to the uh, the net integrated system. Why wind? Well, I think that, you know, just to go make sure that the issue in Texas is clear, is that in Texas, much of the, you know, it was a, it was a political call yes. to point to wind as being unreliable. Wind only accounts for 7% of the electricity in in Texas. And then when you look at where the unreliability came, you can actually see that the natural gas plants were even more unreliable than the wind during the, the really cold event that they had. And then you put on top of that, the fact that Texas sits alone. It doesn't connect with the rest of the grid in the US that you know you have the East Coast grid and you have the West Coast grid and then you have Texas. So what that points to is back to what we've been alluding to is that you need the ability to make electricity and transport it. And you have to make sure that you're able to transport it from places as Roisin said, where that wind is reliable. Wind tends to be more reliable at offshore than it does um, inshore, which is why it's so exciting that that. So I think it's that component of ensuring that we design both to be able to store and to take advantage of those sites where wind is more reliable. So, you know, the Texas case was a politically motivated red herring, really. So it's again, wind has to be part of our solution. It's not the only solution. It's part. It looks like Roisin has something to add here. I can see from her eyes. I can, I can see that too. So I was just going to point, ask, let, let her offer that but right away. I agree with Robin. Um, so th in Texas, they also had a, a, a really cool event back in what, 2011? And they, mm -hmm. it was recommended that they winterize. There is no reason why natural gas plants or anything else don't, can't function in cold. I mean, there are natural gas plants on the North Slope of Alaska. There is zero reason we have the technology. They chose not to winterize their natural gas plants. That was a, a financial and political decision. So I think a lot of it got pushed back onto wind when that was not, that is not the reason that they had such bad, how everything went so horribly wrong. All those natural gas plants froze. They weren't able to turn back on again when they had turned off. And it, like, it was a whole compounding mess of things. Um, but I, I was really surprised during that how much I mean, generator use, it ended up being such a big thing to be able to have generators and houses that did have 
any sort of battery pack, we're able to weather things much, much better. So you get these like Tesla home units, they're the size of your wall, that kind of thing. And I think the new F-150, the Ford, like you can power your house for three days on your new electric Ford 150. That's going to be an interesting way to see. I could see that becoming more and more uh, popular. And I think a lot of it will be if Texas decide that they want to change their minds on that and have it where the backup power, the, the batteries, if they had had the same kind of batteries that are needed to have renewable as part of an integrated grid, they could have restarted those power plants. They didn't have the energy there to restart the natural gas plants until everything thawed itself out. They had no way to heat anything to get them back up and running again. So it was kind of the same issue, the lack of thought ahead. They had been warned, it is possible those very cold events are gonna become more and more frequent as climate's changing even more. And they, it, there was no forethought about planning for that. And that's interesting, Rasheen, because you point to sort of the generator piece, because I think probably a fair number of our listeners are actually in the suburbs around New York, where there's a real uh, push for people to put in generators. So because as our trees have grown, given that we used to, well, most of us are living in places that used to be farms, and the trees get bigger, guess what, the trees fall over and take out the power lines. And there's been this real drive to put in generators. And you can just hear it around my house as, as soon as the um, power goes out. And how we can encourage people to see that either burying the power lines like they do in Europe is expensive, but it's so is a generator. And that the air quality issue again plays in that those generators are just putting out particulates like you wouldn't believe it and noise. So it's again, how can we think about either burying or moving to that electrical backup? You know, the concept that people can have their, their power wall or their Ford truck to get them through that period where the electricity is unreliable due to weather events. You know. Well, I will say the one thing during COVID, we did all, we all stayed home and what I really took from the whole thing was how putting it on personal responsibility to reduce carbon emissions is rubbish. That is not what is going to solve any of this. It is not personal responsibility stuff. So I don't blame people for getting generators or trying to figure out how they're going to power things. Demand better. Your electrical supply companies should be putting them underground. It would save a fortune, but they refuse to put the investment in. So ask for better from governments that insist that energy reliability has to be part of the grid. If we're going to electrify everything, our entire lives are going to depend on this being, I mean, we have already, but if we're going to push it even more and more, then mm -hmm. we need to ask for better from those that are providing us services. And I mean, there's only one electrical supply in Ireland. Yes, everything's above ground. I never, it was so rare to have a power outage in Ireland growing up that it was like a massive big deal if you were out for hours. I have had more power cuts in New York and Boston than I had in my entire life before moving to the US. You guys put up with stuff that no one else would put up with. I don't understand it. Like there could, be, it should be so much better. Now I live in the city, having all those lines underground means we had tornadoes move through. I thought the windows were gonna blow out of my building. I never once worried about power. Now, there's a lot to be said for that, but it means all the power plants are in the city, slowly killing us all. So you get, there's pluses and minuses, but it does mean we could do a lot better. So, Roshi. Sorry. <laughs> you, you, uh, I was gonna say, we're getting, we're getting close to the, the end of our, our panel discussion, which has been great. Thank you both. Um, I wanna give you an opportunity and, and I don't know if you want to just repeat what you just said, but um, to, to give us one big takeaway uh, for this particular audience that we that you would like to have remembered, um, both uh, both of you, Robin and Roisin, and I see Mo Rayma has joined us again. Um, and uh, so, why don't we give uh, either of you an opportunity to say something? You know, a takeaway if you can. I guess my takeaway would be that we all have to be looking for all those solutions, right? It's we we all cannot 
we can't think that by recycling or composting, we're gonna solve this problem. That we in our lives have to look for every lever we can turn. Because all of us have different levers we can turn into, and this is where I disagree with Roisin, I do think there's some individual responsibility there that I think that we as scientists have to walk the walk. Um, but I think we have to do what we can individually, what we can through our institutions, which is why I'm so proud that Mo is pushing, you know, looking to a net zero campus. And we have to look to our governments and our institutions. So it's, it's just like that AGU building. There's no one solution to get to net zero, that, but we have to do every, use every tool we can and we all have to be pushing continuously. And I guess I would say, ask people to ask themselves, where is your energy coming from that your life relies on? Where is that coming from? Is that acceptable to you? Are the co-pollutants, are the everything else that goes with that, is that acceptable to you for the energy you're using in your life? And if not, do something about it, whether it's your power company, your politicians, we're going to have to start pushing to get things moving because we're all just a bit too quiet about it. So how are we going to get things changing? I think wind is one of the, it's going to be a fantastic resource as part of a lot of other things. Um, and we're going to have to start pushing more for all of that to be move forward. New York is 50 years behind Europe in infrastructure, and that's not good enough. We need better. That sure resonates with me. <laughs> <laughs> everyone else as well. Um, Robin, Roisin, I, you know, thank you for your, your amazing research and sharing your insights today, this evening. Um, I'm going to ask Mo if she wants to say a few closing words or closing remarks or ask questions, if you will, um, Absolutely. Before, before signing off. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Roisin and Robin, for what a wonderful discussion and just it was a delight to listen to it. So I just want to thank everybody for their support and for being part of Open House 2021. I failed to introduce myself at the beginning, but I'm Maureen Ramo. I lead Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and I'm also co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School. And please be sure to sign up for our e-newsletter and stay in touch. Thank you for joining us tonight. Goodbye, everyone. Yep. Thanks for joining.